So Teilhard is certainly a genius. He's uh, immense in his vision, and he gives us uh, such an exhilarating vision of, um, the, of the future as we are called to enter into the creativity of God, to carry things forward. Um, we're liberated from just a slavery to the past and repeating the past and tradition, etc. And um, each one of us has the gifts to participate and to help build the earth, build the uh, preparation for the kingdom, and this in connection with the whole universe. So it's um, very exhilarating. There's another side to his teaching, interestingly enough, also another side to his character. He really went through a dark night, anguish, depression for long years, and he had to struggle with that. He's interested in the macro vision that is a vision of evolution, is an evolution of progress. We believe in hope. But uh, he felt at the personal level that uh, human life can sometimes have some real setbacks, real problems. Um, and he expresses this particularly in the book that um, Father Brunner referenced, uh, The Divine Milieu. Both the positive, the upward thrust of the individual in our first years, in our creative years, maybe even towards uh, our later years of energy, creativity, etc. But then there's this mysterious um, decline of energies, of powers, physical, and he says also mental. And um, the end of that is death. What do we do with that? And so he explores that, and I think it's a fascinating kind of other side to the story. And how this micro teaching for the individual relates to the macro vision of the upward expansion. Uh, fascinating question. <clears throat> but at one point, um, he says that this upward progress to a never greater fulfillment of humanity in communion with the universe, he says it resembles nothing so much as the way of the cross. It's not going to be one joy after another, one success after another. He says, as the forces for progress intensify and expand, so some mysterious forces for destruction, for deviation, for violence, etc., they also expand. And so as we go on, it becomes quite a struggle. And this can be in the macro picture also, and in the micro. I think this is evident from a basic things in our time. Atomic energy, that can do so much good, but we're aware that uh, it can do so much harm. Um, the possibility to fly all over the world and to drive anywhere, but um, global warming, how is this related to that? Um, are we moving towards possibly an ecological disaster? Or is there still time to repair this, etc.? Um, these are hot button issues, but uh, we move forward more and more as a united nation, but as uh, Father Daniel suggested, all this violence in our streets, hatred and uh, burnings, etc. Um, uh, Ebola and uh, ISIS. <laughs> Here we have uh, a religious movement that's. Uh, Cutting, into, cutting heads off and things, etc. So this w way of progress, this way of the future, which is also, um, if he's at all on target, the way of the cross. And our individual stories, each one of us, um, we can be very excited about the future. But what if we have only 10 years more to live? Or what if we might die today? We just don't know. Are, to, are we to face these issues of our own mortality? Then what happens? Um, our tremendous fragility. And uh, so um, I'll be talking about that kind of thing. It's kind of, I'm the gloomy Gus after the excitement. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, it's uh, one way to present Teilhard. It's not about the past. He's freed us from the past, the oppression of the past. Now it's the future 
But as Bruno said, um, what about the absolute future? This is a category of runner of theologians, not the um, interval between now and the whatever the consummation, whatever form it takes, not the next maybe 100 years, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, but what about the absolute future that is eternity, that is beyond time, beyond watches and clocks? Uh, that, I, I would say, that's the real attraction of Teilhard. Uh, he also wants us to work nobly with all our different gifts and with enthusiasm for this intervening future. But what can really excite us about that is precisely that it's headed for the absolute future. And that absolute future is somehow <laughs> one with the absolute past. Um, the prologue of John, in the beginning was the word. And this isn't just the beginning of creation, the beginning of history. It's the primordial beginning before any time beginnings that we know. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So that absolute future um, kind of coalesces with the absolute past. And then there's not too much talk in um, Teilhard circles about the present, about the now. There was a few decades ago this big thing about um, practice, sitting, silence, contemplation, get into just this moment, the uh, sacrament of the present moment, because here we are in the present, which is the presence of God, uh, which is a little glimpse of, um, of eternity, of bliss, of fulfillment, etc. So um, I think what Teilhard is interested in is, um, yes, the intervening future and how we should get off our duff and do anything to help it move forward in positive ways, knowing that there'll be all these forces possibly against us and uh, in the opposite directions, not towards convergence, but towards all kinds of uh, dissipation and destruction, etc. So that's kind of uh, very briefly where I am. So uh, again, divine milieu, if you're interested in Teilhard um, in terms of his spirituality for the person, and he had to deal with this because his personal life was not, people picture him as this great uh, smiling optimist, you know, because progress is going on and things are getting better. It's, no, he, uh, he had his struggles. <clears throat> Here's a quote. There's a lovely introduction to the divine milieu by this friend of Teilhard's who knew him intimately, um, another Jesuit, uh, Father Pierre Leroy. Pardon my French. <laughs> Here's a quote from Teilhard. This was when he was only 43 years old. He still had um, um, about 30-some years to live. <clears throat> he said, I feel very much as though I had reached the limit of my powers. I seem somehow unable to keep things in my mind. I have a continual feeling that as far as my own life goes not this magnificent macro vision. As far as my own life goes, the day is drawing to a close. The only way out, I think, is to bling, uh, I'm sorry, is to cling to a blind and absolute faith in the meaning that all things, even the diminishments, must hold for a person who believes that God is the animating force behind every single event. In this book, he'll talk more and more about God, not just the future, not just the earth, not just even the whole universe, but God. And also Christ as the fullness of everything, but also Christ as God. Christ not primarily as the, uh, the rabbi of the first century in Galilee. Um, he acknowledges his full humanity, but now Christ is in glory and Christ is in full union with the Divine Father, and um, the full Christ is all of creation, all of the universe in Christ. Maybe many universes, some physicists, theoretical physicists talk about. Maybe there's an infinity of universes, we don't know. But it's Christ that's drawing all this into uh, the ineffable divinity. So that's, that's um, 
what his hope is later. Um, this is his great friend. In the daily life that concerned Teilhard personally, he was far from being an optimist. He bore with patience, it is true, trials that well may have proven too much for the strongest of us. But how often in intimate conversation have I found him depressed and with almost no heart to carry on. The agonizing distress he already had to face. Um, uh, All his work in China he had to abandon when the Japanese invaded in World War II. And then the order, the Jesuit order says, you may not teach to our young people. Your um, theology is a bit um, dicey. And then Rome came in and has said, you may publish nothing of your religious works, etc. All this stuff. Anyway, uh, during that period, he was at times prostrated by fits of weeping. And he appeared to be on the verge of despair. But calling on all the resources of his will, he abandoned himself to the supremely great capitalized to his Christ as the only purpose of his being. So uh, this is the Teilhard behind uh, the divine milieu and even behind the the, um, phenomenon of man, or what's the new title? Human phenomenon. Human phenomenon. So to have this in mind, uh, it's something like... um, um, Therese of Lisieux, she was always seen as this angelic, smiling figure, and it's all so happy and so simple. She was in the darkest of dark nights, and this was her real courage. And now we've discovered that uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the same, you know, just confront everyone with a smile and do the little thing. Darkest, darkest night. So uh, fascinating that he was there also. And so this book wants to address all of us who... Um, as we age, become more and more not of, not primarily of the divinization of our activities and all we can contribute and the upward evolution, and uh, but of our diminishments, of our limits. So, as I say, this is the gloomy <laughs> conclusion to a joyful, um, enthusiastic one. <laughs> he does talk about the two hands of God. And he expresses it in various ways. There's imminence, but there's also transcendence. There's the incarnate Christ, but there's also the um, risen Christ, and even the Christ who uh, ascends into heaven. There's our actions, but there's also our passivities. There's our expansions, our growth, uh, but also our diminishments. There's earth, the cosmos, but also heaven. There's human and divine, etc. Another one is the two great commandments. Um, You love your neighbor as yourself, and so we want to energize all these gifts, etc., to help humanity grow. But the first commandment, what do we do with that? To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What do we do with a Kamaldolese contemplative space to sit quietly and pray? Um, what do we do with the figure of Mary, not just Martha, who's, who's preparing meals, who's preparing the, the whole thing, but uh, Mary's just sitting there and receiving. Another of his opposite is to give, but also to receive, to conquer, but also to surrender. He goes on and on with these... Uh, And one way you can see it is in the cross, the uh, horizontal, which can express the second great commandment, which can express um, history, the future. Um, But then there's the vertical, which can be in the now, in the, not just the chronos, as I say, not just the, uh, oh, it's this time, but the fullness of time that suddenly comes to me now. Just at lunch, someone was sharing that um, working on an art project, and suddenly in that moment, all kinds of colors, visions, etc., um, that kind of thing. What do we do with all of that? So that's more or less where we're going. <laughs> and then later, there will be questions and comments and room for objections, etc. So the exhilarating, but also the... Um, 
the both and, the cross, also the cross in its sense of suffering and dying, but then resurrection. Could the end of the world take this shape? Not just that we get more and more progressive and more and more expansion, but some kind of cataclysmic, or maybe as Teilhard says, it'll end not with a bang but a whimper. But it is a mystery. It's a mystery how it's going. And if the the uh, course of progress resembles not nothing so much as the way of the cross, uh, that could get a little heavy. <laughs> I just saw there's a rise and a greatness of the moment of the individual and then a decline. Can this be even at the uh, level of nation states? There was a headline just yesterday that the International um, Monetary Fund studies all these things. The largest economy of the world, the largest nation with the largest economy has been up till the present, the United States of America, our booming economy. Uh, just last year, China overtook us, and now the greatest um, economy, nation, the greatest nation's economy is China. And it's going up, and we're kind of struggling. Um, well, to think about that, China, um, what that represents, these recent riots in Hong Kong to have a little more um, freedom. We talk about more and more and more freedom. <laughs> um, okay, but um, we're not quite sure how it'll go as it advances. <clears throat> so the vertical yearning um, is there in Teilhard. And uh, it's... Um, It's this basic yearning in each one of us, again, to get to the micro person. As uh, Augustine said way back, uh, you have made us for yourself, O God, and we are restless until we rest in you. To rest, not just to be active, and in you, not just in the earth, and not just even in progress or uh, the whole universe, but to rest in you, uh, to get to um, some of that. Well, he notes that in this second phase, the first chapter is on the divinization of our activities, and we got um, a lot of that, I think, in Father Bruno's, but the second, which is as long, (laughs) and he says of tremendously more import and significance is the divinization of our passivities. And we want to kind of look at me Look at me. Please look at me. No, we want to look at this now. (laughs) Oh, we're going to have the whole thing now on (laughs) passivity. But activities, uh, clearly what I do. No, passivities. Precisely. Passivities are things that happen to me. We got in the car and it was raining like crazy and it was dark and there were rocks. That was... um, passivities, uh, but then we came here and said, so now I'm giving this lecture and this is activities, but all kinds of passivities hit us. One of our monks recently, he just went blind in one eye, and that's a passivity. The other suddenly felt lots of pain, and that's a passivity. All kinds of, but there are passivities also of growth. Um, Mary kneeling at the foot of Jesus, she's passive, she's not talking, she's not preparing dinner, she's just listening. But that's a passivity of growth, etc. But we'll get into all of his uh, passivities. <clears throat> Teilhard is particularly interested, um, he says, uh, I'll quote him, despite certain appearances of dialectical rigor, the considerations which follow, this is his introduction to the uh, phenomenon of man, do not seek to develop a learnedly coherent construction, a philosophy of things. They seek, on the contrary, to relate a direct interior experience. So um, many um, experts on Taylor say he's primarily a mystic. He's primarily a spiritual teacher. Um, He has this great vision, but he's primarily saying, hey, this is what I see Uh, A great teacher of religion at Oxford University, uh, Professor Zehner, said, Teilhard is a prophet and a mystic, one of the greatest mystics of all time. Well, a mystic is that one who has some kind of unmediated 
experience of the ultimate, of the absolute, and also how the relative works into the absolute and is affirmed in the absolute, in his very, but primarily of the absolute. So that's where we're going. <clears throat> Teilhard said, I've almost made up my mind to write something on mystical science, this science of sciences. It is also the supreme art. And a de Lubach, another very close Jesuit friend, that he is primarily a mystic and we have to... And uh, just as a mystic, <laughs> he's, uh, as many of them do, he's suffered a great deal. Anyway, he says there's the activities, but there's also the passivities. These are kind of the two hands of God. Uh, this is part two of uh, the Divine Milieu. I find this book, oh, by the way, he says, how does he put it? The Divine Milieu is precisely me. This is, this is his deepest um, spirit and soul. <clears throat> Uh, so his first lines, uh, while, uh, oh, and this is non-inclusive language, so I'm going to render it inclusive, so it'll be a little messy as I go along. But while the human person, by the very development of one's powers, is led to discover ever vaster and higher aims for one's action, because of the nature of the human as creature, the human is brought to recognize that in the final act that is to unite him to the all, here's the capital all, this is God with all of creation, the two terms of the union are utterly disproportionate. Um, the human person, the lesser, has to receive rather than give. The human person finds oneself in the grip of what he thought he could grasp. In the sciences, we want more and more to be able to explain it, to know the causes, to know the effects. And no, it's more and more when we find um, we're in the grip of uh, reality. We're possessed by that reality rather than uh, ever more empowered to dominate reality. So this is a, a first introduction. This is for all humanity. Then he says, this is particularly for the Christian the Christian who grows up in the terms of, of the cross and suffering and death and resurrection, etc. The Christian, who is by right the first and most human of humans, is more subject than others to this psychological reversal, whereby in the case of all intelligent creatures, joy in action imperceptibly melt, melts into desire for submission and the exalta exaltation of becoming one's own self into the zeal to die into another. Uh, so this isn't the scientist who wants very much to um, dominate and to understand and to create, but this is um, the yearning as we go on and on to submit, to surrender, to receive. Um, and he goes on in this way. Uh, John of the Cross says that contemplation is to receive. It's not to achieve, it's not to act, it's not to attain, it's to receive. And uh, Teilhard um, tends to uh, echo this. Having been perhaps primarily alive to the attractions of union with God through action, humans begin to conceive and then to desire a complementary aspect, an ulterior ulterior phase in his communion, one in which he would not develop himself so much as lose himself in God. Now this for me is the transcendent, or go up if you like. <laughs> it's the uh, vertical as well as the... Uh... So this is uh, this side of Teilhard. Again, it's not focused in this very um, brilliant uh, work in the... Uh, phenomenon of man or the human. Um, it's uh, in this individual, and maybe the individual is a little microcosm of maybe what's going to happen in the future, we, we don't really know, of um, action, but then going into the, uh, the more passive. Um, interesting, he says, of course, we're most eager to talk about the activities, you know, 
we meet a person, we learn their name, and then we say, well, what do you do? What do you do? That's, we don't ever ask, uh, what passivities have you undergone? <laughs> that would be rude and intrusive. Uh, but uh, that's getting to the depths, he says. That's really getting to the interior These two parts of our lives, the active and the passive, are extraordinarily unequal. Seen from our point of view, the active occupies first place because we prefer it and because it is more easily perceived. But in the reality of things, the passive is immeasurably the wider and the deeper part. Now, I find that interesting. And uh, you don't hear that um, regularly in presenting Teilhard, the scientist doesn't want to be passive. He wants to go in there and work and come out with the um, conclusion and carry us forward in our knowledge, etc. Why would we ever want to be passive given the gifts that God has given us and we are to participate in creation and all of that? Uh, So um, then he explores every kind of passivity. He's got this brilliant mind and there are passivities of growth but then passivities of diminishment and passivities of diminishment that though they're, thereafter bring success, but other diminishments that seem just a total wipeout. But he says, um, we are closer to God in the diminishments than in the activities. Because in the activities, I've got my project, I'm focused on it, I feel my satisfaction. Um, it is about me, it's about us. In the passivities, I'm aware that Uh, It's beyond me, and um, when they get really pretty dark, I have to say, help me, God, you know. Lord, have mercy. Um, But in the good moments, um, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord, etc. But um, it's when we're receiving. Contemplation is to receive. These uh, These are the key things. Well, he wants to see the passivities. Well, who am I? Well, I built who I am through the decisions I've made. I decided to do this, do that. I've achieved this. I write my curriculum vitae. That's not the deepest I. Here he gets into almost an existential philosopher thing. The deepest I is I, the subject, not me that can be analyzed and put in a, a file and... Uh, The deepest I is total mystery, he says. I didn't create this I who is subject, who is the same I, and different from all of your eyes. It's been the same I, subject, from when I was a kid, an adolescent, an adult. Where does this I come from? My parents, did; they they had no idea who would be my I. They tried to determine who would be my me, you know, uh, Always eat all your food and eat salad and things. Uh, But this subject I is a total mystery, he says. Myself is given to me far more than it is formed by me. In the last resort, the profound life, the fontal life, the newborn life, escape our grasp entirely. So the first mystery, the first gift of existentially... (coughs) For me is I. And it's just pure gift. It can only come, he says, from an I, a supreme I, capital I, who is subject, not object, not something, not some um, random collection of, but this uh, mysterious I, who in the Christian view will perdure for all eternity. That's the amazing thing. Then he says, uh, I find myself in this world, this complex of... uh, that individual tree, which is absolutely different from that individual tree, and that leaf, which is different from that leaf. And, but it's, it's not a chaos. It all holds together as one world, one universe. And that it corresponds to our reason, and it reverberates with our sense of beauty, and there's this, that's a mystery. After the consciousness of being something other and something greater than myself, this I... A second thing made me dizzy, namely the supreme improbability, the tremendous unlikelihood of finding myself existing in the heart of a world that has survived and succeeded in being a world. This network of 
significant evolving meaning. And this, where does this come from? And again, he says, from God the Alpha, Christ the Alpha, God the Omega, Christ the Omega. Uh, You'll see that little design in the lower right-hand corner. This is a design he made. He was just uh, trying to sum it all up. So there's these ascending lines, but they're not parallel. They're converging. And he has this famous phrase, all that rises must converge. And this is his great optimism. But where is it going to converge? In a universe that's ever greater and ever expansive, it converges in Christ Omega. And this, again, is the glorified Christ, the Christ who is God of God, light of light, but also human, who sums it all up. And where does it come from? Christ is the Alpha. He is very interested in beginnings. But again, the primordial beginning between before the clock time beginning, before even the uh, Big Bang, Christ is the Alpha. As uh, Father Bruno read from Colossians, all things have been created in and through and for Christ. And that's rather mysterious because he only comes into history in a certain moment, Jesus. But God doesn't just improvise in the whole creation. He has this salvific plan and its culmination is Christ. So from the beginning, everything is ordered towards Christ. Everything wants to assume a Christic shape. So all things from the beginning, the primordial beginning, are from Christ and all uh, go to the fulfillment of Christ. So here he says, uh, in prayer to God, what am I going to do this, this terror of finding myself in this um, massive universe, not just this little being? I felt the distress characteristic to a little creature adrift in the universe, this distress which makes human life founder daily under the crushing number of living things and stars. And if something saved me, it was hearing the voice of the gospel, capitalized, guaranteed by the divine, speaking to me from the depths of the night, it is I, be not afraid. This is this other I, I am who am. So this is what gives him his um, hope and his journeying forward. Um, The hope of progress, the hope of expansion, but this is all um, anchored, so to speak, in this final definitive hope of the I am who am. And then Christ, who's regularly saying, I am. Um, And then he goes on, it is you God, I am, who are at the origin of the impulse and at the end of that continuing pull, which all my life long I can do no other than follow or favor. It's all given to me, and now I simply follow. Um, So this sense of um, surrender to God and move with God is uh, very strong. I can do no other than follow or favor the first impulse and its developments. And it is you who vivify for me with your omnipresence, presence right now, presence in the future, in the past, even more than my spirit vivifies the matter which it animates. Um, God is more our vivifying soul that my soul is vivifying my body. (laughs) Um, The myriad influences which I am the constant object. Not the subject, not dominating, not explaining, understanding, utilizing. In the life which wells up in me and in the matter which sustains me, I find much more than your gifts. It is you yourself whom I find. You who make me Participate in your being, you who mold me. Uh, He's interested in the secondary causes. He's interested in all the scientific efforts and all the rest. But primarily, it is you, the ultimate gift, who is uh, the transcendent God. Um, John of the Cross, he says that the most sublime moments of of mysticism, of union with God, of ecstasy, are based on faith in this life. 
in the next life there'll be vision face to face and that's an ec- ecstasy we can't even uh, begin to understand but now it's faith and Teilhard again echoes this he says uh, all this hope all this being drawn forward towards the magnet of Christ Omega coming out of Christ Alpha it's all based on faith so grant that after I have des- this is a prayer to God always grant that after I have desired I may believe and believe ardently and believe above all things in your active presence this is more important than believing in progress believing in expansion believing in the future believing in the universe uh, believing in you and your active presence so this is the uh, teared i kind of uh, then he goes into the uh, these were the uh, um, the what do you call it the passivities that give us growth to realize that um, my i is a gift and behind it is the i am that the whole universe is a wonder and behind it is this god these are passivities of growth but then there are the passivities of diminishment and he says we we can't ignore these <clears throat> to cleave to god hidden beneath the inward and outward forces which animate our being and sustain it in its development um, this is fine the moment has come to plumb the decidedly negative side of our existences the side on which however far we search we cannot discern any happy result or any solid conclusion to what happens to us it is easy enough to understand that god can be grasped in and through every life but can god be found and grasped in every death and so from now on it gets a little gloomy but uh, what he's wanted to say it isn't ultimately gloomy because of the divinization of our passivities also our parts passivities and even especially our passivities that lead to diminishment and finally death he has a, a vivid description of old age uh, which he writes just a few years after that first passage i read about he felt he was losing all his strength and he couldn't keep an eye in his keep, couldn't keep an idea in his mind etc that slow essential deterioration which we cannot escape old age little by little robbing us of ourselves and pushing us onward to the end um that's death in death uh, and that that's a decline and then the end is death in death is in an ocean all our slow or swift diminishments flow out and merge death is the sum and consummation of all our diminishments it is evil itself purely physical evil it's to be remembered that he was on the front line of world war 1 as a as a uh, i'm blocking on it now pardon me that's it a tr- stretcher bear he saw all these bodies torn to pieces and some maybe still alive and some maybe not uh so he didn't live in an ivory tower kind of thing he's very aware of death and even early on he's aware of his own mortality and his failing this is on page 82 of the divine milieu uh, uh we must overcome death by finding god in it not by saying oh well it's part of some progress and no god is the only answer we've got to death not our uh you know our achievements you should see my curriculum vitae i've written a lot of things and no it's only god at that moment <laughs> we must overcome death by finding god in it here again as in the case of the diviniz- divinization of our human activities we shall find the christian faith absolutely explicit in what it claims to be the case and what it bids us to do christ has conquered death not only by suppressing it its evil effects but by reversing it um and then he goes on by virtue of christ's rising again not the incarnation but the rising again nothing any longer kills inevitably but everything is capable of becoming the blessed touch of the divine hands 
the blessed influence of the will of God upon our lives. So uh, this classically Christian view, but in the context of the whole rest of, again, his uh, macro vision of uh, activities and participate, etc. But it comes down to this for each one of us individually um, in those moments when we're really declining. And again, maybe for as history advances, maybe things get more cataclysmic and difficult if some of the... Uh, Scientists very concerned about global warming or any of these. There's the other thing with uh, Putin, who's in great tension with the West. And are we going back to a cold war? And how will that develop, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so, our struggle against evil. How do we struggle against evil as evil, where we don't see positive outcomes? The first thing is what is our understanding of God? not of evolution, not of the future, etc. But we've got to get back to God. We shall have to begin by saying, God wants to free me from this diminishment, to struggle against evil. This is his picture of God. God, to struggle against evil and to reduce to a minimum even the ordinary physical evil which threatens us is unquestionably the first act of our Father, capitalized, who is in heaven, uh, not in the immediate or proximate future, uh, but in heaven, it would be impossible to conceive God in any other way and still more improbable, still more impossible to love God. So we start here in these moments of diminishment uh, with God. Uh, and so this is a very um, spiritual book that balances other his uh, microvisions. Most certainly it is God who, in the course of the centuries, awakens humans to help us, he says. Um, the physicians, the doctors, the psychologists, the counselors, etc. And um, he goes on to say, <clears throat> and the great physicians in ways that agree with the general rhythm of progress. He it is who inspires, even among those furthest from acknowledging his existence, the quest for every means of comfort and every means of healing. So even the uh, doctors who are absolute atheists, um, Teilhard is insisting, they're only able to do this, to advance, to heal, to help, by the inspiration of God. So uh, again, a lot of God language here. <clears throat> the more we repel suffering with our whole heart and with our whole strength, the more closely we cleave to the heart and action of God. <coughs> So this is how we are divinized in our declines and diminishments, just cleave to God and work with God against any evil. Um, and uh, with God as our ally, we are always certain of saving our souls. That's the good news. But, he goes on, uh, but we know too well that there is no guarantee that we shall always avoid suffering or even those inward defeats on account of which we can imagine our lives to ourselves as failures. In any event, all of us are growing old and all of us will die. This means to say that however fine our resistance, at some moment or other, we feel the constraining grip of the forces of diminishment against which we were fighting, gradually gaining mastery over the forces of life and dragging us physically vanquished to the ground. But how can we be defeated if God is fighting on our side? So again, it's um, all about God ultimately. Um, so, um, this is the good news of Christianity. This is the central, called classically, the, uh, the Paschal good news. The kerygma. God without sparing us the partial deaths nor the final death, which form an essential part of our lives. That's who we are individually. We can't just talk about our active creativity. Transfigures these partial deaths, deaths every day in these uh, in diminishments. Transfigures them by integrating them in a better plan, provided we lovingly trust in him. Not only our unavoidable ills, but our faults even our most deliberate ones 
can be embraced in that transformation, provided always we repent of them. Things that are destructive to ourselves or to our loved ones, etc. If we repent of that, even that works to the integration of a fuller union with God. Not everything is immediately good to those who seek God, but everything is capable of becoming good. And here he quotes the uh, marvelous, radical uh, optimism of St. Paul. For those who love God, everything works to the good. How? It's not always clear, but everything works. Providence, for those who believe in it, it's always based on faith, not on uh, science and verification, etc. Providence, for those who believe in it, converts evil into good. And then he has three ways that it does so. And one way is to, um, you've got some goods, they're ripped away from you, and you journey on with courage, then you get greater goods. And he says the example is, um, is Job at the beginning as family and all these goods, and then he goes through all this hell, and then he's got more goods and family at the end. <laughs> these can happen in little ways. Uh, we were um, deprived of a good drive down here with all the Darkness, it could have been worse, and rocks. <laughs> but then suddenly we're here, then there's sun, and there's a wonderful lunch, etc. So that's one of the ways where we suffer a diminishment. We can't see clearly the road ahead, and we don't know if there's rocks right around the corner. But then uh, this happens. There's another kind of diminishment that leads to good if there's no clear kind of earthly good on the other side that's better than this. But I grow in patience, I grow in courage, I grow in uh, character, etc. That's another. But uh, what about those goods, what about those diminishments uh, where I can see no good coming out of them at all? But there are more difficult cases, and here he says amazingly, I think, the more difficult cases, the most common ones, in fact. And here's the... uh, side of Teilhard, very much in touch with human suffering, where human wisdom is altogether out of its depth. At every moment we see diminishment, both in us and around us, which does not seem to be compensated by advantages on any perceptible plane. Premature deaths, stupid accidents, weaknesses affecting the highest reaches of our being. Under such blows as these, One does not move upward in any direction that we can perceive. One disappears or remains grievously diminished. How can these diminishments, which are altogether without compensation, wherein we see death at its most deadly, how can these become for us good? Um, Then, in the moment of death, we can set no limits to the tearing up of roots, that is involved on our journey into God. So he's facing directly the the drama of the individual who's headed towards death. And this is quite a different picture from, again, his macro vision of the future. But he wants to do both and, because we can't cease to be individual. We can't cease to be existential personally, just in favor of an exhilarating uh, macrovision. <clears throat> so what is death? It is the sum and type of all the forces that diminish us and against which we must fight without being able to hope for a personal, direct, and immediate victory. Now, and here's this now, uh, which shifts entirely. Now the great victory of the Creator, capitalized, and Redeemer in the Christian vision is to have transformed what is in itself the universal power of diminishment and extinction into an essentially life-giving factor. God must in some way or other make room for himself, hollowing us out and emptying us if God is finally to penetrate into us to the profundity. And in order to assimilate us into God, God must break the molecules of our being so to recast and remodel us radically. So, so this is, uh, and in that way, (laughs) and in that way, its fatal power 
deaths to decompose and dissolve will be harnessed to the most sublime operation of life. This is true harnessing, but it comes from God, from Christ, not from us. What was by nature empty and void, a return to bits and pieces, can in any human existence become fullness and unity in God. This is our goal. This is what it's all about. And also maybe on the macro vision, all of humanity, all of creation, as uh, St. Paul says, is yearning um, for the freedom of the children of God in God, who is the fullness of freedom, the fullness of beauty, the fullness of love, etc. So, um, I'll conclude with his prayer uh, to God in the midst of these uh, diminishments, also this final diminishment. So he's addressing God here. After having perceived you, capital, as he who is greater than myself, grant that when my hour comes, that I may recognize you under the species of every alien or hostile force that seems bent upon destroying or uprooting me. And here he goes on, and he's a poet, among other things, not a rigorous scientist in these passages. <clears throat> when the signs of age begin to mark my body, and still more, when they touch my mind, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, etc., when the ill that is to diminish me or carry me, carry me off strikes from without or is born within me, when the painful moment comes in which I suddenly awaken to the fact that I am ill or growing old, <clears throat> and above all at that last moment when I feel I am losing hold of myself and am absolutely passive within the hands of the great unknown forces that have formed me, in all those dark moments, O oh God, grant that I may understand that it is you, provided only my faith is strong enough, who are painfully parting the fibers of my being in order to penetrate to the very marrow of my substance and bear me away within yourself. Teach me to treat my death as an act of supreme communion. Amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.